Sarah, it's okay. Having a great time together, it's... Is it wherever you are? The last one that made here is that. Why don't we try to It's a mantra. Oh, yeah. I just like to let you know. They were really trying to get. They were very good. 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 All right, everyone, welcome back. All right, I'm actually pleased. There are not that many absences. Um, I'll just go my little rant for a minute, then I'll move on. So every spring semester, the law school recruits students to skip my class. Uh, that's the only way to put it, right? They, they basically have academic credit for people to skip class. It's a very important role. They gain very important experience, but they're all serving as witnesses now, not sitting property. So you have five absences. You can use them however you wish, and that's how people use them. That's all I'm going to say. I've gotten very much more angry in the past, and I've gotten over it over the years. So just Deep breath, move on, live with it. Yes, Randall? Yeah, it's 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 class nineteen. Open up class nineteen, I'm sorry. I um I put in the wrong uh, Google Docs. So if you go to class nineteen, you'll see it. It was, as Patty reminded me, class twenty one a couple of years ago. Uh, but I messed up the wrong. So if you go to class nineteen, you'll see it. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, any questions before we get started? So I'm sorry for the long break. I do I don't like canceling class. I try not to do it, but I did have to cancel it yesterday or Tuesday. So you yeah, had a really long spring break. It's funny, 2020, uh, we broke for spring break right before COVID. And I remember I told my students, like, were you gonna come back after spring break? I'm like, no, <laughs> I'll never see any of you ever again in person. Uh, and that's the way it went. But uh, thankfully you were all here smiling. All right, um, questions. You don't even know what the hell we covered last time. All right, so let, let me just sort of recap, and we could you know, walk back to the present moment. Um, so far, we've done three other classes on zoning, OK? If you recall, the very first topic was Village of Euclid, the Ambler, right? This was the sort of the foundational case that said that the government can regulate land use without violating the due process clause or the takings clause. Right. And the express purpose of this zoning was to separate uses. That is to have um, some places to be industrial, some places to be residential, and even more particular, one family residential, two family residential, and so on. Right. It created this very elaborate sort of pyramid, this grid of who could live where. Uh, the property owner said this is sort of arbitrary. Why does the government get to decide who lives where? But that ship sort of sailed in the 1920s. Okay. In the next class, we talked about um, uh, some exceptions. We have the variances, which is for a substantial hardship. And with a special exception, where there are specific criteria that the legislature lays out, those criteria can be used to sort of provide uh, an escape. A very rigid zoning code. Are you with me so far? Okay. All right. And then we moved on to what might be called aesthetics. Here we did a case from Palm Beach, which I didn't like very much, and the two other cases I recommended you read, and hopefully you did read them, right? The courts have long allowed the regulation of property based on aesthetics, but not for the reason you might think, right? It's not that we're going to regulate this property because it's very attractive or pretty or pleasant. Instead, you can regulate the appearance of property to serve a value, specifically property values, right? That's a way to keep property values high 
you can regulate what property looks like. So certain colors, certain palettes, and so on. Now, there are cases where the courts say you've gone too far, you're making up these rules as you go along, people don't even know what the law is. Those are sorts of outliers. As a general matter, the government has a lot of discretion over what things actually look like. Okay. All right. And that sort of brings us to where we are today. And this is one of the, I'll just say, one of the weirdest classes of the semester. I'm sure those of you who did the reading, all 30 something pages will probably agree with me because these two cases don't feel like property cases at all, do they? They're con law cases. So I guess I'm, I'm somewhat qualified to teach this class. I don't know. Uh, but I, I just feel like I'm teaching the wrong class, like walking to the wrong classroom. Um, now you've taken con law, right? Have you taken First Amendment yet? Or are you taking it now? Who's taking it now? Who has not taken First Amendment yet? All right. So for half of you, this probably didn't make much sense, or at least was sort of hard to grapple with. So I'll, I will do my best to sort of walk through um, today's reading with mind that half of you haven't really either taken First Amendment or haven't completed yet. If you've taken it, have you done religion yet or your own speech? Chest our religion. Good. Yeah, that's about where you are. About the mid midterm. Okay. I can work with that. Thank you. All right. So let's start walking through. The theme of today's class is where zoning laws intersect with the First Amendment with regard to religion, with regard to speech, and with regard to what's called the freedom of association. Uh, you'll notice that the freedom of association is not actually in the First Amendment. Read it, it's not there. Uh, there's a freedom of assembly, but there's no freedom of association. Okay. So it's up here, very short. You spend an entire semester on these just four or five lines, but that's how it works. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. As I'm sure you all know, the First Amendment is sort of a trump. It, it prevails over any... <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little bit under the weather, I, it's not even, I'm not even sick. I, I, had, I was in a hotel the other night and the mattress was too firm and I woke up with just this terrible backache. I'm barely, hard to me to turn, so I'll just turn my body rather than turning my head. So, so just feel bear with me for today. Try to undo my neck, right? So the First Amendment, of course, trumps any federal or state land use regulation. So indeed, many of the cases where the courts actually review land use regulations is not based on uh, you know, allegations of unfairness or it's arbitrary or the like, it's actually based on the First Amendment. And there's a lot of good case law here. So talk a bit first about speech, right? Say, wait a minute, Josh, how, how is there a free speech issue with land use? Well, think back to the case from Palm Beach, right? The really wealthy guy, I think you guys called him. He wanted to build a house to convey a message of simplicity, of modernity and things of that nature. Uh, the court didn't really answer whether he had a valid claim because of some procedural issues. The dissent, which you read, went into this very long, or you read at least a chunk of it, the dissent went into this very long discussion over how architecture was a form of expression. And specifically, how architecture could be used to convey messages. So if you think of Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, who built the Empire State Building, he built Falling Water, right? These very famous architects used their designs to convey messages about society, about art, and the like. So there are cases where people can make allegations that architecture is protected, but they don't go very far. I think the Palm Beach case is probably an illustration of why. Um, another aspect where free speech and property laws are sex this is going to sound very boring but it's very important signs right you ever drive down the highway see those billboards right for bucky's right you see them every five feet right mm -hmm. uh i love bucky's by the way my favorite place in the world um you may not know this but there are actually very strict guidelines of where billboards can appear especially you know the new digital ones that sort of flash really bright they can be kind of distracting I, I don't want to like diminish people's businesses, but like those can be very distracting, uh, especially if there's a lot of traffic. 
um, so how high up the billboards have to be, right? What kind of illumination that that be lit from below? Um, what sort of elements are allowed on them? Uh, approval, for example, you know, is there a board that can approve what messages belong on billboards on public highways, right? So you have all these restrictions. Um, another area exists about temporary signs. So for example, uh, election signs. We all know every November, it seems, every lawn, every highway, every public street is littered. I shouldn't use the word litter, that's wrong. Is basically covered with signs for various political campaigns. And hopefully after the election, they get taken away, but most of them don't. You just drive around, you still see some from the last election everywhere you go. Um, so a lot of jurisdictions enact si a, a law saying how quickly signs must be removed after, for example, election. So there was one case that came up a few years ago involving signs for events, which basically said any sign for an event must be removed the same day as the event, which might sound you know, like a good rule, but it came to be that a church would advertise its services. And every week the church had services in a different location. And as you know, Sunday is the day of rest. And it wasn't practicable for them to remove the sign on Sunday. They want you to move it on Monday. I'm sort of simplifying the facts a lot, right? There were also restrictions of how big the signs could be, right? So this is a sign advertising a church service. It has to be an address, right? Some information. And based on the size they needed, you couldn't really fit all the information such that it could be seen from a road. And so the Supreme Court actually said this was unconstitutional, that these restrictions on signage violated the free speech rights and maybe the free exercise rights of the, uh, of the, of the church. And if you care, the name of this case was Reed versus Town of Gilbert from Arizona. What's the name? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are restrictions to those signs as well. I'll give you an example. Um, this is the last few months. Chick-fil-A wants to put up a massive sign. There was a Chick-fil-A near one of the freeways in Houston. And they wanted to put like a 50-foot sign next to the freeway. And they did not get permission. <laughs> yeah, but like the pole's like 50 feet tall, like a really tall uh, Chick-fil-A sign. And I think they wanted to do that to advertise to people driving on the freeway. Um, and the city said, no, that's just too tall. It's too much of a distraction to people on the highway. You're on the highway, right? You're seeing all these signs flashing by. They're directional signs, people cutting you off. Everything you add is sort of distraction in a way. And one second, Fernando, I see your hand. Um, uh, LBJ's wife, uh, President Johnson's wife, Lady Bird Johnson, one of her most famous programs was called the Be Beautification of the Highways Program, where she enacted these laws. Not she enacted, but she, she supported laws nationwide that sort of decluttered or made it harder to build signs on federal interstate highways. Um, so this happens a lot. Yes, sir. Right. They had to install a camera space back at the billboard. Oh, really? So they could troubleshoot, or so they could make sure that our common messages and advertisers. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Do they capture any traffic stops? Um, capture people like houses. Oh, man. Activities in there. So, so oh, that's, I, I don't know about that. I've heard, I know there was at least one case where one of those cameras captured a traffic stop where there was an allegation that the police mis misbehaved. And that was the only, there was no dashboard cameras. That was actually the only evidence of the of the of the incident. Okay. All right. So again, your book doesn't have the sign cases. They're kind of useful. I think maybe it should be added, but but just so you know they're out there. Um, another area I almost hesitate to say it, but I'll mention is adult dancing, uh, similar to the adult bookstore case, right? Um, many efforts by the government to shut down, for lack of better words, strip clubs, right? People go and they're naked or at least partially naked. Um, the courts have said that live nude dancing is a free speech right. That engaging in dancing, well, dancing's free speech. And if you take your clothes off, it's still free speech. That's what the courts have said. Whether that's right or wrong, I'll leave that for someone else to talk about. Um, but so even if you have a, a zoning regulation that says no live dancing in this, in this region, 
that zoning reg can be challenged on the ground that violates the freedom of speech. So the famous case is Shad versus Borough of Mount Ephraim, E-P-H-R-A-I-M. Just guess what say it's from. You want to guess what say it's from at a strip club? There it is, winner. <laughs> Where else would it be from, right? Uh, sorry, that, 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 that was mean, but, but yeah, it's from New Jersey. Uh, where else? Uh, it, what's that? What? Well, in Vegas, they would allow it. Yeah, Vegas, <laughs> Vegas, I guess everything's legal in Vegas, as, as it were. Uh, but this was the case. Actually, I just Googled it. I forgot. Mount of Rhymes from Camden, which is actually not too far from Mount Laurel. So, uh, so there you go. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, Jean Morant doesn't <laughs> visit there. All right, we'll move on. Uh, oh, that's really bad. That was really bad. I, I hope he, uh, team, if you know what I'm talking about, it's okay. Um, I, I don't have Instagram. I swear I don't have Instagram. Okay. All right. Um, what else about free speech? Uh, that's it. Yeah, it's mostly signs and adult dancing are the two sort of biggest areas of the law. Okay. There's also religion, and this is where things get a little bit complicated. Um, uh, have you all studied, in, for those of you who have taken First Amendment, Employment Division versus Smith? Have you done that one yet? Sherbert versus Werner? Yes? No? No. All right. I'll have to do more. Did you study in con law the city of Bernie versus Flores with RIFRA? Okay, I live with that. All right. So the free exercise clause says that Congress make no law abridging the free, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Right? Well, what does it actually mean? Does it mean they can only, they can't violate your beliefs or violate your actions? I'll just give you a very easy example, which is polygamy. For many people, for a time, their law, their religion required having multiple spouses, multiple wives, polygamy, Mormons and others. If the government bans polygamy in the Utah Territory, does that burden the free exercise of the Mormons? You bet it does. But can the government prohibit that act? And what the court said long ago was that the First Amendment extends to beliefs. In other words, they can't ban your beliefs, but they can restrict your practices. Now, for people who are religious, that doesn't sit very well because it's very hard to separate your beliefs from what you do. Many things that people do from you know, circumcision, among other things, your religious beliefs are manifested in a physical act. So throughout the 20th century, the Supreme Court sort of ping-ponged on this issue. For a time, the court said that even neutral acts that burden religion aren't constitutional. Even if it's not intended to target religion, it's still invalid. Okay. But then in 1991, the court decided a case called Employment Division versus Smith, very famous case from Oregon. Uh, the case involved a um, Native American who lost his job in part because he was using peyote, right? Peyote was part of his religious sacrament. Okay. Okay. Um, Smith challenged his, um, he was actually eventually denied employment benefits. He challenged the denial of his benefits on the ground that the state's law burdened his religious exercise. Supreme Court said, too bad, right? Um, this law was neutral. The government banned a wide range of drugs. It wasn't targeting just Native Americans, wasn't targeting just peyote. Therefore, he had no claim under the free exercise clause. All right. But then Congress responded. Congress enacted a very famous law called RIFRA, R-F-R-A, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA. Okay. The purpose of RIFRA was to, as the name suggests, to restore the free exercise standard that existed before Smith was decided. In other words, Laws that burden free exercise, we reviewed with what's called strict scrutiny. That is, it's very hard for the government to prevail. So again, Riffra said, even if a law is neutral, that is, it's not targeting religion specifically, you still have to deal with a strict scrutiny standard. All right, so that's Riffra. But there's a problem with Riffra. Riffra limited both the federal government and the state government, both of them. Okay, restricted both governments. Now, Congress, of course, can restrict itself, right? Congress can whatever restraints it wants on itself. But Congress cannot always put restrictions on the states. Did you say the 11th Amendment at all? 
No, I don't teach it either. Um, the 11th Amendment says broadly, I'm going to hate myself for saying this, that states can't be sued by people because of what's called sovereign immunity. Now, it doesn't actually say that, <laughs> but that's how the courts understood it. As a matter of general law, the 11th Amendment is interpreted to say that people can't sue the states. But RIFRA allowed people to sue the states for violating their religious rights. This case came up. It was actually from outside San Antonio, the city of Bernie. You know from Bernie? You know where it is? Okay, good. Yeah, it's near San Antonio, right? So you had a church that wanted to expand. And the zoning board said, no, you can't expand. You have a beautiful church. It's really nice. We don't want you destroying your facade. And the church says, we need more space to have all of our people come to pray. And the government said, no, 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 no permit for you. They filed suit under RIFRA. Goes to Supreme Court. Supreme Court says that is unconstitutional. That Congress cannot. How do I put this without confusing you? That Congress cannot allow a state to be sued in this context. That, that, that Congress went beyond its powers. So as a result, RIFRA only applies to the federal government. But Congress responded again. And Congress enacted another law. It's my favorite acronym. R-L-U-I-P-A. R-L-U-I-P-A. Pronounced RELUPA. I swear that's how it's pronounced. RELUPA. And it stands for the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. The Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. This law governs nationwide property transactions, and also people in prisons or other types of homes, that are, those are institutionalized. And Reliopa basically says any land use decision that burdens religion is subject to strict scrutiny. And there's some caveats about when it applies, when it doesn't, that are not very important here, but it applies just about everywhere. It applies in Houston, among other places. So today, most free exercise litigation is not actually brought under the First Amendment. Most first, uh, free exercise litigation with property is brought under RELUPA. And you see it all the time. I know people have litigated cases in town about churches who want zoning permits and the like. So in some regard, houses of worship have a better chance of fighting a zoning board than a regular person because of RELUPA. Right? The government needs a very good reason to deny a permit to a church, whereas a regular person, you know, whatever, too bad. Uh, there are arguments that RELUPA actually violates the Establishment Clause. It gives too much of a preference to religion. The courts rejected this argument in a case called Cutter versus Wilkinson in 2003 or so. Is it hot in here or am I just feeling it's not? Yeah. I'm, it's, okay, I'm glad it's not just me. I'm getting worried. Okay. Yeah, sorry. The, when the code comes up, you know I'm uncomfortable. All right. Um, yeah, I guess it was cold this weekend, so it got really hot all of a sudden. Um, all right, hold with me. All right, so again, with regard to free speech, there's some cases. With free religion, it's really based on RELUPA standard. Uh, there's some notes on this which are useful to read, but, but not, nothing too much. Okay? All right, questions so far? Now the sleeves are coming up. It's really hot in here. Um, sorry. All right, so let's do the first case. This is kind of a weird case. You've probably never had a case like this before. Uh, or maybe you have, I don't know. You didn't just in Kamala, did you? I don't think so. Um, this is a case called the Village of Belterra versus Boris. If you look in the notes, which I've now corruptly posted, I actually have a sign, a picture of a sign for welcoming people. Not everyone's welcome, but at least some people are welcome. Um, who wants to give me the facts in this case, please? Oh, oh no, sorry, wrong class. In my other... In my evening class, I stopped cold calling because they just weren't prepared. So I, I just, I asked for volunteers, but your class is still prepared, so I will go around. Where are we? Does anyone even remember? Uh, I'll just start to make it easier. Kelsey, you want to give me the facts, please? Oh, he's in the bathroom. Look at that. Okay, go ahead. A Belterra, just, just, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Mm-hmm. One thing, dwellings, so lodging houses, boarding houses, return houses, dwellings houses, one house. Mm -hmm. Only family has one of the dwellings uh, related to blood adoption or marriage, and the only one that is blood adoption or marriage to only two people. Very good. Mm -hm
but um, the Dignans owned the house and they leased it out to a group of six unrelated um, university students. And then um, the village served the Dignans with an order to revenue violations of the ordinance. Right. And the Dignans and three of the tenants brought a Section 1983 action for an injunction and judgment declaring the ordinance. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for that, Kelsey. Right. So let me, can I give you the backstory of what's going on here? Um, the village of Altair is in Long Island and is very close to Stony Brook University. Only for Stony Brook, the state school in New York. Um, this was the 1970s. As I say, if you remember the 70s, you weren't there. Um, during this time, there was a very big fear, and I'll use the word, of hippies. I'm, I'm, I swear, this, this, is the, this is what the case was about. And there was a fear that hippies would come together and make communes where they sort of communally live inside, typing this down, right? <laughs> they would make communes. It's okay. It's, I, I, can, I can back this up. They were afraid of people making communes in their homes. <clears throat> or maybe to put it a little bit more in modern terms, making basically fraternity or sorority, right? Or something close to it. We have these group housing of young college students or people who maybe were of college age living together. Right. That's why this statute was enacted. It was designed to keep out young people. And the law, as Kelsey explained to us, was specifically tied to blood relations, marriage, or children, which generally college students do not have any of those. Right? They're not related. They're not married. Maybe they are. I don't know. And they don't have kids. Or maybe they do what they're aware of. Right? Uh, but the kids aren't living with them, at least. Right? Now, again, this case was decided in the 1970s. Supreme Court was a very different place. Uh, this was Justice Douglas's opinion. He was one of the oldest serving, I think he had the longest tenure of any justice ever, at least close to it. He served for 36 years. So again, Douglas was appointed by FDR, and he's still serving in the 1970s. Um, it didn't end so well, though. He had a, a stroke later in his career, and the stroke debilitated him, and he refused to resign. So the justices worked out this arrangement. This is crazy. Where if there was any vote, where his, if there was any case where he cast a deciding vote, they would re-argue the case. In other words, they would not let him cast the fifth vote for any case. And they basically marginalized him. And eventually, they just removed him from the um, from the rotation. And he resigned eventually. Okay. The majority opinion was by Justice Douglas, and the dissent was by Justice Thurgood Marshall, whom Drew Study was the first African American justice. He had been the lawyer. Uh, for the NAACP, he worked on school desegregation cases, so he was also a, a, a giant at the time. The vote was 8-1. It is really hot in here, is it? Can we open the doors? Would that make any difference or no? Is that even possible? Maybe prop a garbage can or something? Because I... If the door, door door stop will be good. Yeah, I'm, it, I'm going to have to go outside in a few minutes. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's me. You're cold? Uh, all right. No, not COVID. No coughing, nothing else. All right. All right. Fine. I'm going to push through. I'm going to endure. All right. So, again, Justice Douglas in the majority. <laughs> I'll see how I pull off. I think I can pull it off. Okay. I don't like stopping. All right. So, Justice Douglas in the majority and Marshall's in dissent. All right. So, the issue here is one of con law, right? Why does this policy exist, right? So, Sarah, let me ask you a question. What was the stated rationale for why this policy is put into effect? If you know, in other words, you're the government lawyer, why would you enact this policy? So in this case, making sure that there is peace and quiet, it Good. Okay. Now, now, very good, Sarah. Now, Patty, let me ask you a follow-up question. If their interest was in maintaining peace and quiet, what is the most natural regulation you think they would try to adopt to accomplish that goal? Land in other words, if you're... In other words, if your concern was that things would be too noisy, what would your regulation actually do? Yeah. For example, nuisance and otherwise, right? You would regulate the noise, for example, nuisance laws and otherwise. 
Patty, did this law regulate noise? Yeah. Did. Right. So the law didn't actually accomplish the goal they set out to accomplish. It's one of the weird parts of this decision. But then the question is, what do you do about this? And this raises the issue of deference, right? How much deference should governments afford to um, land use boards that make these decisions? The majority by Justice Douglas is extremely deferential. Now, Justice Douglas had written the opinion in the village of, I'm sorry, he was not that old. He wrote the opinion in Berman v. Parker, a famous eminent domain case from 1954. Berman said that um, when you have, uh, this was an eminent domain case. The government basically demolished a neighborhood to increase property value. They said, we're going to seize this neighborhood to put in higher value properties who can generate more revenue. And the court said, yeah, that's just fine. Right, the court would not second guess decisions concerning property. That's what happens here, right? Justice Douglas applies a very strong level of deference to this case. He says it's not the court's role to second guess what the legislature does. If they decide the best way of restricting noise is to restrict people to live together, that's not for us to question. Now, Justice Marshall comes back in dissent, and he makes a fair point. He says, huh? Right? If you're actually concerned about noise, you'd restrict noise. If you're concerned about overcrowding, you would restrict how many people are going to live there, not with regard to who's married or unrelated. And he said this was a, basically an attack on people for being unmarried. In other words, punishing them for a particular lifestyle. Now, why was that wrong? Um, Justice Marshall explained this violates the First Amendment. Or does it? Does he mention the First Amendment? He references the freedom of association, which, again, if you look on our screen, it's not actually in the First Amendment. But the courts have said it's sort of called a penumbra. It's sort of based on the freedom of, uh, 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 of assembly. And this is the idea that you get to choose who you live with, who you can choose to be with, who you choose to associate with. This was often used to protect various groups. For example, the state of Alabama wanted to get the membership roles to the NAACP. And they said, we need to have them for organizational purposes, to know who, who your members are. Okay, that wasn't the reason. They want to threaten and retaliate against people to join the civil rights group. Okay, the court said that that violates the freedom of association. In this case, Thurgood Marshall says it's very similar. Here, the government is targeting people based on their family choices. If unrelated people want to live together, call them polyamorous today, perhaps. That phrase didn't exist in the 70s. People want to live together in different sorts of living arrangements. They can do that, right? But Marshall had only one vote, and that was it, okay? So this is a case where we talk about pretext, right? Where the government gives one rationale for the decision, that seems very clear there's another rationale underlying it, all right? Jordan, is that hand? Oh. All right. All right. I'll finish up quick. I can I can push to the next case a little bit quicker. This case is not much longer. Next case. All right. All right. Any questions on Village of Altera? All right. The next case, again, I don't like using the word weird, but it's one of those unusual cases in your book. Right. Again, it's from the New Jersey Supreme Court. So don't take this as a uh, look. I think I told you it's the first week of class. Cases in New Jersey are outliers. Right? These are not majority rules. They're not minority rules. It's a Jersey thing. And this is a case called Southern Burlington. Yeah. Why do you think New Jersey is so weird when it comes to voting? Like, it's not coincidence. I don't know. I don't want to comment. I'm from Staten Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the mental stuff's still here. Just the, it's a little warm. I'll, I'll take care of everything. I'll finish, I promise. All right. Um, so this is a very unusual case. Uh, so we have this town. Actually, uh, give me the facts. Uh, I can't see your name tag. I'm sorry. Gwen. I'm sorry. Your name. Oh, you never name tag. Okay. Hey, Gwen, you want to give the facts in the briefly? I know the facts are very long and involved. Just as generally, what are the facts in this case, please? Mount Laurel. Mm -hmm. But only a part of it actually. Mm -hmm. 
was there space that was actually zoned for people to live with, uh, I'll say a two family house or an apartment dwelling? None. Did they zone any space for seniors? No. Did they zone space for people who raise families for not living in one family homes? No, thank you. So this was a very, how do we put this? Carefully written zoning law. The purpose of which was to keep out poor people. <laughs> I can't, I, I don't I don't have any words to say other than that. that. That was it, right? If you can afford a one family home, welcome. Right. If you want a house in the backyard and you know a driveway, you can come move to Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Uh, if you don't, adios. Right. You can't live here. Um, then the question becomes what to do about it. Right. I think we can all agree uh, this is a problematic design. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you don't agree with it at all. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But then the question is what to do about it. And what the Jersey court said here, again, they're interpreting the state constitution, not the federal constitution, is that. The government has an obligation, an obligation to provide what they call affirmative action, to make housing available, to make it available for people of low income housing. And the court grounds this in the idea of fairness, that you can't exclude people. OK, but how does this actually work in practice? If you read the notes after the case, it didn't work out so well. And I want to make this point uh, very clearly to you all. Just because a court issues a decision doesn't mean that everyone gets on board. Right. In fact, one of the things you don't talk, maybe talk about in con law, one of the things we don't really think about is why do people follow judicial decisions? Right. In other words, if the government imposes, sorry, if the court imposes this massive mandate on the state or on every county to provide affordable housing, what if the people just say, that's nice? We're not going to do it. And so on love, we say, well, it's bad to ignore courts. And of course, that's true, right? Uh, but how do you actually put pen to paper? In other words, how do you actually force these municipalities to actually build the housing? And we saw in this case, it took decades, decades. And eventually, some stuff got built, not really as much as they wanted, but a very small amount was built many years later. OK? I'll see what I actually want to cover in this one. This one actually is probably well enough to skip. Max. It did. It did. Did you study Cooper versus Aaron in law school in con law? This was the case of Little Rock, not the Little Rock Nine, right? The the so-called massive resistance to Brown, where there was an effort by southern states and some northern states too to resist the decision in all manner of ways. So just because the court issues a decision doesn't mean people sort of get online and they can resist it for many years to come. All right. All right, questions about Laurel. All right, I'm gonna call it quits. I'm gonna go figure something out. I gotta, I'm not feeling terribly well. It's gotten worse progressively. I feel about this morning. All right, thank you so much. I'll see you all later. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay. uh, I will, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to maybe close my eyes for a bit. Thank you. I appreciate your concern.